Hi, welcome back to Church Institute Manuals. Today we'll be going over the May 29th through June 4th curriculum for Come Follow Me. And we'll be reading in the Institute Manual for Matthew 26, Mark 14, and John 13. Introduction and Timeline for Matthew 26 The information in Matthew 26 begins Matthew's account of the events of the Atonement, from the Savior's foretelling of what was about to happen to him through Peter's three denials of Christ. The important events leading up to and including the Atonement account, including the Savior's Last Supper with his disciples, at which he instituted the sacrament, an ordinance that represents his Atonement, to his suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane, during which he explained intense agony of body and soul, yet submitted his will to his Heavenly Father, and three, his betrayal, arrest, and trial before the Jewish Council. The chief priests and scribes sought to kill Jesus. As the feast of the Passover approached, the Savior knew that his betrayal and crucifixion were near, and he prophesied to his disciples that these things would occur during the feast time. The chief priests and scribes gathered together at the palace of Caiaphas, the high priest, to consult how they could take Jesus and kill him without creating an uproar among the people. The chief priests and elders represented the religious and lay leadership of the great Jerusalem Sanhedrin. They knew that many people admired Jesus Christ, and they were concerned that if they tried to take Jesus when there were so many pilgrims in Jerusalem for the holidays, there would be riots. 30 Pieces of Silver The chief priests covenanted to pay Judas Iscariot 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus Christ into their hands. This sum fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah, If ye think good, give me my price. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. According to the law of Moses, 30 shekels of silver would compensate an owner for the death of a slave. Thus, in addition to fulfilling prophecy, the betrayal price reflects the low regard Judas and the chief priests had for the Savior. No one is foreordained to do evil. Judas chose to betray the Savior. The Joseph Smith translation explains that one reason for Judas's betrayal was the doctrine the Savior taught, quote, Nevertheless, Judas Iscariot, even one of the twelve, went unto the chief priests to betray Jesus unto them, for he turned away from him and was offended because of his words. The Passover and the Sacrament During the time of Moses, the Lord had instituted the Passover feast to help the children of Israel commemorate the time when he delivered them from bondage in Egypt. On that occasion, the Lord smote the firstborn of the Egyptians, but he passed over the house of the children of Israel to put the symbol of the blood of a sacrificial lamb on their doorposts. At the Last Supper, the Savior instituted the sacrament, a new symbolic meal of commemoration. Just as partaking of the emblems of the Passover pointed to the future sacrifice of Jesus Christ and helped ancient Israel remember their release from Egyptian bonds, Partaking of the sacrament helps us remember Jesus Christ's atoning sacrifice, which can release us from the bondage of sin. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles asked, Do we see the sacrament as our Passover, remembrance of our safety and deliverance and redemption? Lord, is it I? The apostles had traveled with the Savior throughout Galilee and Judea. In the course of their travels, In interactions with him, they had become his trusted friends. Surely they were shocked by his announcement during the Passover meal, One of you shall betray me. Each of them in turn began to ask, Lord, is it I? President Boyd K. Packard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles encouraged us to follow the example of the apostles in these verses and consider whether counsel from the Lord and his servants pertain to us. Quote, There is a lesson to be drawn from the 26th chapter of Matthew, the occasion, the Last Supper. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. I remind you that these men were apostles. They were of apostolic nature. It has always been interesting to me that they did not, on this occasion, nudge one another and say, I'll bet that it's old Judas. He that he has surely been acting strange lately. It reflects something of their, nat- of their stature. Rather, it is recorded that they were exceeding sorrowful and began to every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? Would you, I plead, overrule the tendency to
to disregard counsel and assume for just a moment something apostolic in attitude, at least in, in, oh, sorry, I was read that again. Would you, I plead, overrule the tendency to disregard counsel and assume for just a moment something apostolic in attitude, at least, and, and ask yourself these questions. Do I need to improve myself? Should I take this counsel to heart and act upon it? If there is one weak or failing, unwilling to follow the brethren, Lord, is it I? The Emblems of the Sacrament When Jesus instituted the sacrament during the Last Supper, he taught his apostles that the emblems of the sacrament represent his body and his blood. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland discussed the significance of the sacramental emblems. With a crust of bread, always broken, blessed, and offered first, we remember his bruised body and broken heart, his physical suffering on the cross where he died, where he cried, I thirst, and finally, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The Savior's physical suffering guarantees that through his mercy and grace, every member of the human family shall be freed from the bonds of death and be resurrected triumphantly from the grave. With a small cup of water, we remember the shedding of Christ's blood and the depth of his spiritual suffering, anguish which began in the Garden of Gethsemane. There, he said, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. He was in agony and, pr and prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The Savior's spiritual suffering and the shedding of his innocent blood, so lovingly and freely given, paid the debt for what the scriptures call the original guilt of Adam's transgression. Furthermore, Christ suffered for the sins and sorrows and pains of all the rest of the human family, providing remission for all of our sins as well. Upon conditions of obedience to the principles and ordinances of the gospel he taught. As the Apostle Paul wrote, we were bought with a price. What an expensive price, and what a merciful purchase. That is why every ordinance of the gospel focuses in one way or another on the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. And surely that is why this particular ordinance, with all its symbolism and imagery, comes to us more readily and more repeatedly than any other in our life. Commemorating the Savior's Atonement The Joseph Smith translation clarifies that the Savior commanded his disciples to continue to perform the ordinance of the sacrament. These verses also make clear that one purpose of the sacrament is to provide the opportunity for the Savior's followers to commemorate his atonement. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and break it and blessed it, and gave to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is in remembrance of my body, which I give a ransom for you. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is in remembrance of my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for as many as shall believe on my name for the remission of their sins. And I give unto you a commandment, that ye shall observe to do the things which ye have seen me do, and bear record of me even unto the end. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I shall come and drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This is my blood of the New Testament. The Savior's statement, this is my blood of the New Testament, alluded to important terms in the Old Testament. The word that is translated testament can mean covenant. When the Lord made his covenant with the children of Israel, the people covenanted to obey the words of the Lord. Moses offered a sacrifice to the Lord when he took blood from the sacrifice and sprinkled it on the people, saying, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you. When Jesus Christ alluded to this statement, as recorded in Matthew twenty six twenty eight, he taught that the New Testament, or covenant, was about to be ratified with blood, just like the Old Covenant, and that the blood which... The, and the blood he would shed for us would cover our sins and blot them out, just as the sacrificial blood symbolically covered the people in Moses' day. Let's read Exodus 24, 3-8. It says, And Moses came and told the people all the, world, all the words of the Lord, and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice, and said, All the words which the Lord hath said we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and rose up early in the morning, and builded an altar under the hill 
and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord hath said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. The prophet Jeremiah recorded, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, indicating that Israel's old covenant with the Lord would be replaced. When Jesus presented the cup of wine to his apostles, he was signaling the fulfillment of the old covenant and the establishment of the new covenant. The Savior will partake of the fruit of the vine. As recorded in Matthew 26, 29, the Savior told his disciples that he would not drink of the fruit of the vine again until he drank it with them in his Father's kingdom. Thus, the sacrament not only symbolizes the Savior's atonement, but also looks forward in anticipation to the time when he would return to the earth in glory. In the latter days, the Lord revealed to the prophet Joseph Smith details of a future occasion when he will drink the fruit of the vine on the earth. As recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 27, the Lord revealed that he will partake of the sacrament again on the earth with his followers, including many ancient prophets such as Moroni, Elias, John the Baptist, Elijah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, who was sold into Egypt, Peter, James, and John, and also with Michael or Adam, the fall, the father of all. The Lord's followers include all those whom my Father hath given me out of the world. This means that if we remain true and faithful to the covenants that we have made and endure to the end, we will be among those who partake of the emblems of the sacrament with the Savior at this future time. All right, so we're going to read DNC 27, 4 through 14, which says, Wherefore, you, you shall partake of none except it is made new among you, Yea, in this my Father's kingdom, which shall be built up on the earth. Behold, this is wisdom in me. Wherefore, marvel not, for the hour cometh that I will drink of the fruit of the vine with you on the earth, and with Moroni, whom I have sent unto you to reveal the Book of Mormon, retaining the fullness of my everlasting gospel, to whom I have committed the keys of the record of the stick of Ephraim, and also with Elias, to whom I have committed the keys of bringing to pass the restoration of all things spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began concerning the last days. And also John, the son of Zacharias, which Zacharias, he, Elias, visited and gave promise that he should have a son, and his name should be John, and he should be filled with the spirit of Elias, which John I have sent unto you, my servants, jo Joseph Smith, Jr., and Oliver Cowdery to ordain you unto the first priesthood, which you have received, that you might be called and ordained even as Aaron. And also Elijah, unto whom I have committed the keys of the power of turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, that the whole earth may not be smitten with a curse. And also with Joseph and Jacob and Isaac and Abraham, your fathers, by whom the promises remain, and also with Michael, or Adam, the father of all, the prince of all, the ancient of days, and also with Peter and James and John, whom I have sent unto you, by whom I have ordained you, and confirmed you to be apostles, and a special witnesses of my name, and bear the keys of your ministry, and of the same things which I revealed unto them, unto whom I have committed the keys of my kingdom, and a dispensation of the gospel, for the last times, and for the fullness of times, in the which I will gather together in one all things, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, and also with all those whom my Father hath given me out of the world. When they had sung a hymn, the hymn the Savior and his disciples sang at the conclusion of the Last Supper was probably the traditional Jewish recitation from Psalms 
113 through 18 called Hallel. Psalms 113 through 14 were traditionally sung at the beginning of the meal, and Psalms 115 through 18 were traditionally sung as part of the formal closing of a Passover meal. So 113 says, Praise ye the Lord, praise, O ye servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord, blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forever, forevermore. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, and his glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high? Who humbleth himself to bring the things that are in heaven and in the earth? He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. And he maketh the barren woman to keep house, and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Psalm 114 says, When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob, from a people of strange language, Judah was his sanctuary, and Israel his dominion. The sea saw it and fled. Jordan was driven back. The mountains skipped like rams, and the little hills like lambs. What ailed thee, O thou sea, that thou fleddest? Thou Jordan, that thou wast driven back, ye mountains that ye skipped like rams, and ye little hills like lambs. Tremble, thou earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, which turned the rock into a standing water, the flint into a fountain of waters. And then it says, Psalms 115 through 118, uh, that happened after they took the sacrament, I think it said. I'll go back and review that. It says in one fifteen, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes they have, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses they have, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is every one that trusteth in them. That sounds a lot like uh, Christianity today in most uh, most other sects where they, they don't believe God has a a mouth or ears or nose or hands or feet and can walk. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord hath been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. Ye are blessed of the Lord which made heaven and earth. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth, and forevermore praise the Lord. Psalm 116 I love the Lord, because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon his name, will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found terrible and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord, and gracious, yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, All men are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. 
Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am thy servant. I am thy servant and the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem, praise ye the Lord. 117. O praise the Lord, all ye nations, praise him, all ye people, for his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. And this is the last one, uh, Psalm 118. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because he because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endureth forever. I called upon the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore, shall I see my desire upon them that hate me? It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations compassed me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. They compassed me about, yea, they compassed me about, but in the name of the, of the Lord I will destroy them. They compassed me about like bees. They are quenched as the fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Thou hast thrust sore at me, that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song, and is become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. I shall not die, but live, and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord hath chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over unto death. Open me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them, and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord, into which the righteous shall enter, I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God. I will exalt thee. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Yeah, so Psalms 113 through 14 were sung at the beginning of the meal, and 115 through 18 were sung as part of the formal closing of the Passover meal. All ye shall be offended because of me this night. As the Savior and his disciples left the upper room and walked toward the Mount of Olives, the Savior told the disciples that all of them would be offered would be offended because of him that night. He then referred to a prophecy found in Zechariah 13.7 by saying, Smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Peter responded by saying that he would never be offended because of the master, but Jesus' reply to him illustrates that he knew Peter better than Peter knew himself and that he likewise knows each of us better than we know ourselves. Following the Savior's arrest, later that night, his disciples temporarily became scattered, and Peter denied the Savior three times. This prophecy that the Savior, that the shepherd would be smitten is one of many uttered by the Savior during his mortal ministry to prepare his disciples for his coming death. Examples of such prophecies are found in Matthew 12:38 which says, Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Okay. And Matthew 16, 21, 
From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. And Matthew 17, 9 and 22 through 23 says, And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man, until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. Twenty seventeen through 19 says, And Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed under the chief priests and under the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock, and to scourge, and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. And the last one is Matthew twenty one, thirty three through thirty nine, which says Here another parable there was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. It's the parable of the husbandman. A place called Gethsemane, found on or near the Mount of Olives, just outside Jerusalem's walls, Gethsemane was a garden of olive trees the Savior often visited. On this night, the Savior had come to Gethsemane to suffer for the sins of all mankind and work out the infinite atonement. The garden lay to the east of the temple in Jerusalem, as outlined in the Law of Moses, when someone desired to make a burnt offering, he selected a male animal without blemish and presented it to the priest at the east door of the tabernacle. During the New Testament times, the offering was presented to the priest at the eastern gate of the temple in Jerusalem. These acts can be seen as a similitude of the Savior presenting himself to his father in the Garden of Gethsemane. President Russell M. Nelson explained there in, the, there in the garden, bearing the Hebrew name of Gethsemane, meaning oil press, olives had been beaten and pressed to provide oil and food. There at Gethsemane, the, the Lord suffered the pain of all men, that all might repent and come unto him. He took upon himself the weight of the sins of all mankind, bearing its massive load that caused him to bleed from every pore. The following account illustrates one way in which the oil exuded from pressed olives can graphically represent the blood Jesus Christ shed in Gethsemane. One fall semester, I supervised the students at the BYU Jerusalem Center as they participated in their own olive harvest and pressing activity. The olives were placed in the yam or rock basin and the crushing stone was pushed around and around the basin until the olives began to ooze their oil. When the oil began to run down the lip of the limestone basin, it had the distinctive red color characteristic of the first moments of the new pressing each year. At that instant, an audible gasp came from the 170 students who surrounded the olive press to witness our recreation of the ancient pressing process. It was a stunning, even chilling minute until the oil turned back into its usual golden color. I believe everyone in that group had the same thought as we watched this happen. It was more than just an amazing confirmation of the symbolism we had discussed. This was, right before our very eyes, a real-life reflection of Gethsemane. In the place called the oil press, Gethsemane, the Savior was pressed in our behalf as he wrought for all mankind the infinite and eternal atonement. He took with him Peter, James, and John. As the Lord had done in previous occasions, he separated out Peter, James, and John from the other apostles. It is not known why he singled out these three on this occasion. However, we do know that they would preside over the church following his ascension into heaven. Perhaps this experience in Gethsemane would provide them valuable knowledge of the Savior's suffering, allowing them later to serve as witnesses of the atonement. Through this, they learned that because the Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak, they needed to watch and pray so they would enter not into, into temptation. The Savior's Sufferings in Gethsemane While Matthew's account tells us about some events in Gethsemane, we learn from additional scriptural and prophetic sources 
more about the meaning of what transpired there. King Benjamin taught that Jesus Christ felt pain of body, hunger, thirst, and fatigue, and anguish for the wickedness and abominations of his people. Alma recorded that Jesus experienced the pains, afflictions, temptations, sicknesses, and infirmities of his people, that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities. Alma also stated that the Son of God suffered according to the flesh, that he might take upon him the sins of his people, that he might blot out their transgressions according to the power of his deliverance. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles stated that in carrying out the atonement, the Savior faced great challenges. Quote, First, an enormous sense of responsibility, for he realized that except it be done perfectly, not one of his father's children could return to him. They would be forever banished from his presence, since there would be no way to repent. For broken laws and no unclean thing can exist in the presence of God. His father's plan would have failed, and each spirit child would have been under the eternal control and torment of Satan. Second, in his absolutely pure mind and heart, he had to personally feel the consequences of all that mankind would ever encounter, even the most depraved, despicable sins. Third, he had to endure the vicious attack of Satan's hordes while physically and emotionally pressed to the limit. Then, for reasons we do not fully know, while at the extremity of his capacity, at the time the Savior most needed succor, his father allowed him to shoulder the onerous responsibility with only his own strength and capacity. Elder Tad R. Callister of the Presidency of the Seventy described some of what Jesus endured in Gethsemane and later on the cross in order to free all mankind from the evil one. Quote, with merc merciless fury, Satan's forces must have attacked the Savior on all fronts. The Savior pressed forward in bold assault until every prisoner was freed from the tenacious tentacles of the evil one. This was a rescue mission of infinite implications. Every muscle of the Savior, every virtue, every spiritual res reservoir that could be called upon would be summoned in the struggle. No doubt there was an exhaustion of all energies, a straining of all faculties, an exercise of all powers. Only then, when seemingly all had been spent, would the forces of evil abandon their posts and retreat in horrible defeat. The great Deliverer has rescued us, saved the day, saved eternity, but oh, what a battle, what wounds, what love, what cost. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. The Savior's words, nevertheless, not as I will, but thou wilt, indicate his submission to his Father in heaven but sustained him and strengthened him so that he could drink the bitter cup of the atonement. Certainly there were many factors. Scriptural and prophetic teachings give us some answers to this question. He was motivated by complete and perfect love for his Father in heaven and devotion to him. He revealed that he so loved the world that he gave his, only, his own life. He endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. President Lorenzo Snow taught that the atonement required all the power that Jesus had and all the faith that he could summon for him to accomplish that which the Father required of him. The Savior's submission to the will of the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane set an example for us, inviting us to submit to God's will in our life. Elder Robert D. Hales of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained, It taketh it takes great faith and courage to pray to our Heavenly Father, not as I will, but as thou wilt. The faith to believe in the Lord and endure brings great strength. Some may say if we have enough faith, we can sometimes change the circumstances that are causing our trials and tribulations. Is our faith to change circumstances, or is it to endure them? Faithful prayers may be offered to change or moderate events in our life, but we must always remember that when concluding each prayer, there is an understanding thy will be done. Faith in the Lord includes trust in the Lord. The betrayal of the Savior. During the New Testament times, it was customary for men to greet each other with a kiss on the cheek. Such greetings were a symbol of respect, particularly when bestowed by a pupil upon a great rabbi. They communicated brotherhood and friendship. Thus, there was irony in Jesus' words when he said to Judas, Friend, wherefore that art thou come? And betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? 
the Savior could have summoned legions of angels. The Savior's statement that he could pray and summon more than 12 legions of angels helps us appreciate his willing submission to his arrest and the abuse that followed. Taken literally, 12 legions of angels would have been between 36,000 and 72,000 angels. This cursing of a fig tree a few days before had shown that he could destroy with a word. He had power to defend himself, but chose not to use it at this time. The Book of Mormon prophet Jacob taught his people of the Lord's power, saying, He can pierce you, and with one glance of his eye he can smite you to the dust. Elder N., or Gerald N. Lund, who later became a member of the Seventy, wrote about the Savior's voluntary choice not to use his power to defend himself from the abuses he experienced. Quote, Imagine the being whose power, whose light, whose glory holds the universe in order, the being who speaks, and solar systems, galaxies, and stars come into existence, standing before wicked men and being judged by them as being of no worth or value. When we think of what he could have done to these men who took him to judgment, we have a new and different sense of his condescension. When, G when Judas led the soldiers and the high priests to the Garden of Gethsemane and betrayed him with a kiss, Jesus could have spoken a single word and leveled the entire city of Jerusalem. When the servant of the high priest stepped forward and slapped his face, Jesus could have lifted a finger and sent that man back to his original elements. When another man stepped forward and spit in his face, Jesus had only to blink, and our entire solar system could have been annihilated. But he stood there. He endured. He suffered. He condescended. Jesus Christ's response when Peter cut off the ear of the high priest's servant shows the compassion of the Son of God even toward those who wished to harm him. Who was Caiaphas? Caiaphas was the high priest from AD 18 to 36 and was a son-in-law of Annas, who was the high priest from AD 7 to 14. Caiaphas belonged to the Sadducees. During New Testament times, the position of high priest had become a corrupt political appointment rather than a legitimate priesthood office. Caiaphas held the position longer than any other high priest in the New Testament times, indicating his close cooperation with Roman government leaders like Pontius Pilate. Caiaphas' responsibilities as high priest included controlling the temple treasury and overseeing temple rituals, which made him considerable money. Because of these temple responsibilities, he probably would have regarded the Savior's cleansing of the temple courtyards as a challenge to his authority and a threat to his wealth. After the Savior raised Lazarus from the dead, Caiaphas stated that it was necessary to put Jesus to death, and he possibly even let out in the conspiracy. That says to see John eleven forty nine fifty three, which says, And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. As high priest Caiaphas presided over the Sanhedrin as and was one of the main interrogators of Jesus Christ on the night of his arrest. To put him to death, the council referred to in Matthew 26, 59, was the great Sanhedrin of Jerusalem, an assembly of 71 members, including Levites, chief priests, scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, and those of other political persuasions, all presided over by the high priest, who was Caiaphas at this time. It was the highest Jewish court of justice and the supreme legislative council in Jerusalem. Its main function was to interpret Jewish law and regulate Jewish life. The chief priests and others of this council sought, sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, implying that they were unable to find credible witnesses, that their case against him was weak, and that their actions were pre premeditated. The Charge of Blasphemy by definition, blasphemy meant to revile, despise, mock, or curse God. 
Jesus Christ did none of these, but Caiaphas considered the Savior's statement that he would sit on the right hand of power to be blasphemous. However, the Savior's claim to divine power and authority would have been blasphemy only if it had been untrue. When Caiaphas heard this statement, he rent his clothes and declared that the Savior had spoken blasphemy, an offense punishable by death under the law of Moses. He and the members of the council pronounced that the Savior was now guilty of death. However, since blasphemy was a Jewish matter and of no concern to the Romans, the Jewish leaders changed the charge to sedition when they took Jesus to Pilate. For more information on this charge of sedition, see Commentary Mark 15. Mistreatment of the Savior by the Jewish Council The Son of God would have been in terrible physical condition as he stood trial before Jewish leaders. During the hours prior to his interrogation, Jesus had experienced the agony of Gethsemane. He had been back and forth across the Kidron Valley. He would have also been experiencing the effects of blood loss and likely the effects of chills from the night of air upon his weakened body. He had also likely not slept in many hours. It was in this weakened physical condition that he faced additional abuse at the hands of his accusers. Nephi prophesied that because of his loving kindness and his long suffering toward the children of men, the Savior would willingly suffer the indignities and abuses heaped upon him. The Jewish leader spit in Jesus' face, buffeted him, and slapped him. They blindfolded him and mocked him. The Apostle Peter later declared, Christ also suffered for us, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. Elder Bruce D. Porter of the Seventy taught that the Atonement required the Savior to endure the abuses of the Jewish and Roman leaders without sinning. The cruelties and indignities suffered by Jesus during the various trials represented a last-dish effort by Lucifer to cause Christ to stumble. A single misstep, a crossword, an angry outburst, even a moment's indulgence of self-pity or pride, and all was lost. Hence, every possible indignity was heaped upon the Savior, false accusations, blasphemous outbursts, a crown of thorns, the horrible scourging by bone-embedding whips, the mock robe of royalty, the spitting, taunting, and physical blows of the soldiers. The whole pitiable drama was masterminded by Lucifer in the hope that he might yet find a way to nullify the Redeemer's triumph at Jerusalem. Peter's Denials of Jesus Christ President Spencer W. Kimball invited us to remember Peter's great love for the Savior and the Savior's trust in him as we think about Peter's actions in denying the Savior three times. I do not pretend to know what Peter's mental reactions were, nor what compelled him to say what he did that terrible night, but in light of his proven bravery, courage, great devotion, the limitless love for the Master, could we not give him the benefit of the doubt? and at least forgive him, as his Savior seems to have done so fully. Almost immediately, Christ elevated him to the highest position in his church and endowed him with the complete keys of that kingdom. Hearing the bird's announcement of the dawn reminded him not only that he had denied the Lord, but also that all the Lord had said would be fulfilled, even to the crucifixion. He went out and wept bitterly, for his Tears for personal repentance only, or were they mingled with sorrowful tears and realization of the fate of his Lord and Master and his own great loss? Only hours passed until he was among the first of the tomb as the head of the group of believers. Only weeks passed until he was assembling the saints and organizing them into a compact, strong, and unified community. It was not long before he was languishing in prison, being beaten, abused, and sifted as wheat, as Christ had predicted. All right, so next we'll read Mark 14, and then we'll go to John 13. So Mark 14... says, Conspiracies Against Jesus Christ. 
From the beginning of the Savior's ministry, politicians in positions of power felt that their power was being threatened by him, and they tried to have him destroyed. Herod ordered the slaughter of infants in Bethlehem to try to destroy Christ. When Jesus cleansed the temple in Jerusalem, the chief priests plotted to put him to death. These secret combinations even involved the high priest's office. When the Savior openly entered Jerusalem, he quickly became the object of conspiracies to destroy him, including the agreement Judas Iscariot made with the chief priests to, do, to betray the Savior into the hands of those who wanted to destroy him. A woman anointed Jesus for his burial. In John's record of the event recorded in Mark 14, 3-9, John identified the woman who anointed Jesus as Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. The alabaster box was a jar containing ointment of spikenard, an an aromatic ointment used as perfume and to anoint the dead. By anointing Jesus while he was still alive, the woman acknowledged his impending death and burial. She is come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying, the Savior said. The anointment was very expensive, worth more than 300 denarii, or about a year's wages for a common laborer. Elder James E. Talmadge stated, To anoint the head of a guest with ordinary oil was to do him honor. To anoint the feet was al- was also was to show unusual and, and signal regard. But the anointing of head and feet with spikenard, and in such abundance, was an act of reverential homage, rarely rendered even to kings. Mary's act was an expression of adoration. It was the fragrant outwelling of a heart overflowing with worship and affection. The Savior stated that the woman's actions would be spoken of for a memorial of her throughout the world. What was it about this incident that made it worthy of such lasting remembrance? In addition to her overflowing gratitude, the woman of Bethany stands out as the first disciple in the Gospel of Mark to understand and openly accept the Savior's teaching that he must suffer and die. Elder Talmadge suggested that Mary may have gathered from the remarks of Christ to the apostles that the sacrifice of his life was impending, noting that the accounts in both Mark and John are suggestive of definite and solemn purpose on Mary's part. A large upper room. Mark noted that the Last Supper was held in a large upper room in Jerusalem. In cities of ancient Israel, upper rooms of houses were the choicest rooms because they were above the crowds of the city streets and provided privacy, an appropriate setting for the sacred events of the Last Supper. The Savior's Suffering in Gethsemane Mark's language bears witness of the reality and severity of the Savior's suffering. The Greek word translated sore amaze in the text can refer to a range of emotions including amazement, awe, astonishment, following great shock, and overwhelming distress. The Greek verb translated very heavy can mean depressed, dejected, and full of anguish or sorrow. Together these words depict a deep and extreme agony. The Savior said that his soul was exceedingly sorrowful unto death, that is, his anguish was so intense that he felt he was at the point of death. Elder James E. Talmadge stated, Christ's agony in the Garden of is unfathom, unfathomable by the finite mind, both as to intensity and cause. The thought that he suffered through fear of death is untenable. Death to him was preliminary to resurrection and triumphal return to the Father. His struggle and He struggled and groaned under a burden such as no other being who has lived on earth might even conceive as possible. It was not physical pain nor mental anguish alone that caused him to suffer such torture as to produce an extrusion of blood from every pore, but a spiritual agony of soul such as only God was capable of experiencing. Elder Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles quoted from these verses of Mark as he spoke of the suffering of the atonement. In Gethsemane, the suffering Jesus began to be sore amazed, or in the Greek, awestruck and astonished. Imagine Jehovah, the creator of this and other worlds, astonished. Jesus knew cognitively what he must do, but not experientially. 
He had never personally known the exquisite and exacting process of an atonement before. Thus, when the agony came in its fullness, it was so much, much worse than even he, with his unique intellect, had ever imagined. The culminative weight of all mortal sins, past, present, and future, pressed upon his perfect, sinless, and sensitive soul. All our infirmities and sicknesses were somehow, too, a part of the awful arithmetic of the atonement. The, the anguish Jesus not only pled with the Father that the hour and cup might pass from him, but with this relevant citation, he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. In this extremity did he, perchance, hope for a rescuing ram in the thicket. I do not know. His suffering, as it were, enormity multiplied by infinity, evoked his later soul cry on the cross, and it was a cry of forsakenness. Even so, Jesus maintained his sublime submissiveness as he had in Gethsemane. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Note the Joseph Smith translation for Mark 14, 36-38 indicates that the terms sore amazed and very heavy can also describe the Savior's disciples in, in Gethsemane. Abba, Father. Mark is the only gospel writer who recorded that Jesus Christ addressed his Father in prayer using the Aramaic term Abba, meaning Father or My Father. There is no scriptural record of anyone before Jesus Christ addressing God in this manner. Typical Old Testament ways of addressing God in prayer included, O Lord God, O Lord God of hosts, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and O God of our salvation. In later years, some people developed a tendency to address God with a litany of titles that paid homage to his, to his sovereignty, glory, graciousness, and other divine attributes. The Savior's use of Abba Father was a striking contrast to this practice. It was both simple and profound. It indicated a close personal relationship with a personal being. The Savior taught his followers to address God in prayer as their Father, our Father which art in heaven. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles spoke of the significance of the Savior's plea to his Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. In that most burdensome moment of all human history, with blood appearing at every pore and an anguish cry upon his lips, Christ sought him whom he had always sought, his Father. This is such a personal moment, it almost seems a sacrilege to cite it. A son in unrelieved unre un pain, a father his only true source of strength, both of them staying the course, making it through the night, together. On another occasion, Elder Holland commented further, Mark says Jesus fell and cried, Abba, Father. This is not abstract theology now. This is the son pleading with his father, All things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Who could resist that from any child, especially the perfect child? You can do anything. I know you can do anything. Please take this cup from me. That whole prayer, Mark noted, was asking that if it were possible, this hour would be stricken from the plan. The Lord said, in effect, If there is another plan, or if there is another path, I would rather walk it. If there is another way, any other way, I will gladly embrace it. But in the end, the cup did not pass. In the end, he yielded, he yielded his will to the will of his father and said, Not my will, but thine be done. This cup. The Savior sometimes spoke of his atoning suffering and death as a cup. This term drew upon a long history of scriptural symbolism. The cup sometimes symbolized God's wrath. It could also represent judgment and punishment of the wicked. Isaiah prophesied that the day would come when the Lord would plead the cause of his people and remove out of their hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury, so that his people would no more drink it again. After his resurrection, the Savior taught that the Nephites, I have drunk out of the bitter cup which the Father hath given me, and have glorified the Father in taking upon me the sins of the world, and the which I have suffered the will of the Father in all things from the beginning. In addition to the cup of wrath, the Old Testament contains references to a cup of blessing and salvation. In the great exchange of the atonement, the Savior drank out of the bitter cup for us, for us, so that he could offer us the cup of blessing. 
So let's read about the cup. In Psalm 75, 8, it says, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red, for it, it is full of mixture, and he putteth, poureth out the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. Thinking of temple imagery with the cup. Let's see. Uh, Isaiah 51. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury, that has drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. Mosiah 3, 24 through 26. And thus saith the Lord, they shall stand as a bright testimony against this people at the judgment day, whereof they shall be judged every man according to his works, whether they be good or whether they be evil. And if they be evil, they are consigned to an awful view of their own guilt and abominations, which doth cause them to shrink from the presence of the Lord into a state of misery and endless torment, from whence they can no more return. Therefore they have drunk damnation to their own souls. Therefore they have drunk out of the cup of the wrath of God, which justice could no more deny unto them than it could deny that Adam should fall because of his partaking of the forbidden fruit. Therefore mercy could have claim on them no more forever. And Isaiah 51.22, we just read Isaiah 51.17, and then in verse 22 it says, Thus saith the Lord, the Lord and thy God, that pleadeth the cause of the, his people, Behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt no more drink it again. And then the cup of blessing is Psalms 16.5. <coughs> Excuse me. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and the cup and of my cup, thou maintainest my lot. And Psalm 23, 5, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. And Psalm, oh, this was part of the hymn that we read. Psalm 116, 13 says, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. And they all forsook him and fled. Though Jesus Christ was powerful enough to defend himself against the armed multitude, the disciples saw that he did not intend to do so, and they fled in fear. Mark included the detail about the young man who, wrapped in a linen cloth, followed the Savior until several members of the multitude laid hold on him, causing him to leave the linen cloth in their hands and flee. The Joseph Smith translation says that the young man was a disciple of Jesus Christ. Among other things, this account shows that Jesus was forsaken by his disciples and left alone to face the cruelties that lay ahead. The Hearing Before the Council Mark's account of Jesus' hearing before the Jewish council is the longest found in the four Gospels. One important detail that Mark alone preserved is that the witnesses who testified against the Savior bore conflicting testimonies. Since the law of Moses required at least two corroborating witnesses to convict anyone of a capital offense, the charges against Jesus were invalid. The Savior remained silent, refusing to dignify the falsehoods with any response. Finally, Caiaphas, the high priest, asked Jesus outright, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? The Savior's affirmation of in Mark is the most forthright preserved in the four Gospels, I am. To this powerful statement, Jesus added, And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. In making this statement, the Savior drew upon scriptural prophecy, including Daniel 7, 13-14, which declares that the Son of Man will come in the clouds of heaven, and Psalm 110.1, which declares that the Messiah will sit at the right hand of God. This testimony that Jesus gave about himself clarified his mission as the Messiah, as the Son of Man. <clears throat> the Savior's testimony also warned the council, even as they were judging him, 
that the time would come when he would be enthroned and sit in judgment on them. The Savior's answer shows that he looked beyond the immediate suffering to the future victory, particularly his ascension to his Father and his future coming in glory. Quote, Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Close quote. So let's read Daniel seven thirteen through 14 which says, And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. And Psalm 110 verse 1 says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Okay, and now we need to go to John chapter 13. It's the last chapter. My voice is getting very tired. This is, this is long for me. Ooh. I'm going to pause for a second. The Savior's Washing of His Disciples' Feet John's Gospel does not record all the events of the Last Supper. John chose to focus on the Savior's washing of the disciples' feet at the conclusion of the meal and also on the Savior's discourse to His disciples. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that the Savior's washing of the disciples' feet showed His unfailing devotion to His disciples. In the midst of the Last Supper, Christ quietly arose, girded Himself as a slave, or a servant would, and knelt to wash the apostles' feet. This small circle of believers in this scarcely founded kingdom were about to pass through their severest trial, so he would set aside his own increasing anguish in order that he might yet once more serve and strengthen them. It does not matter that no one washed his feet. In transcendent humility, he would continue to teach and to cleanse them. He would he would, to the final hour and beyond, be their sustaining servant. As John wrote, who was there and watched the wonder of it all, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. So it had been, and so it was to be, through the night and through the pain and forever he would always be their strength, and no anguish in his own soul would ever keep him from that sustaining role. Washing the feet is a gospel ordinance. The Joseph Smith translation provides an additional insight into the washing of the disciples' feet. Now this was the custom of the Jews under the law. Therefore, or wherefore, Jesus did this that the law might be fulfilled. Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught that when the Savior washed the disciples' feet, he fulfilled the law of Moses and performed a gospel ordinance. Washing of feet is a gospel ordinance. It is a holy and sacred rite, one performed by the saints in the seclusion of the temple sanctuaries. It is not done before the world or for worldly people. For this day and dispensation, Jesus instituted it in the upper room at the time of the Last Supper. Our Lord did two things in the performance of this ordinance. One, he fulfilled the old law given to Moses, and two, he instituted a sacred ordinance which should be performed by legal administrators among his true disciples from that day forward. As part of the restoration of all things, the ordinance of washing of feet has been restored in the dispensation of the fullness of times. On December 27, 1832, the prophet Joseph Smith received a revelation that declared, Sanctify yourselves, yea, purify your hearts, and cleanse your hands and your feet before me, that I may make you clean. That's DNC 8874. In that same revelation, the Lord commanded the prophet to organize the school of prophets, saying that those who were put who were part of the school shall be received by the ordinance of the washing of feet, 
Elder McConkie further explained, In the case of the School of the Prophets, the ordinance of washing of feet is to be performed by the President of the Church. In compliance with this revelation, the Prophet on January 23, 1833, washed the feet of the members of the School of the Prophets. On March 29 and 30, 1836, in the newly dedicated Kirtland Temple, the leading brethren, including the First Presidency, Council of the Twelve, Bishoprics, and Presidents of Quorums, participated in the ordinance of washing of feet. Thus, the knowledge relative to the washing of feet has been revealed step by step in this day until a final knowledge is now incorporated in the revealed ordinances of the Lord's house. <clears throat> Peter objected and then consented to having the Savior wash his feet. In New Testament times, people wore open sandals, walked on mostly dirt roads that accumulated the filth of beasts, and had only irregular access to bathing water. Their feet became very dirty, and washing another person's feet could be a distasteful task. Peter's initial rejection of this master's offer to wash his feet can be understood in light of the fact that this custom of hospitality was usually performed by the lowest level of servants. However, when the Savior explained to Peter that having his feet washed was essential to fellowship with him, Peter then asked for a more complete washing, which the Savior explained was not necessary. Peter's request illustrates the respect he had for the Lord and his earnest desire to follow him completely. Disciples of Jesus Christ followed his example. President David O. McKay saw a great example of service in the ordinance of the Savior washing the, the disciples' feet, speaking to the church in the April 1951 General Conference when he was sustained by the members of the presidency of the church, he said, When the Savior was about to leave his apostles, he gave them a great example of service. You remember he girded himself with a towel and washed his disciples' feet. What an example of service to those great servants, followers of the Christ. He that is greatest among you, let him be least. So we sense the obligation to be of great service, greater service to the members of the, sh the church, to devote our lives to the advancement of the kingdom of God on earth. If you know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. After providing an example of service for his disciples by washing their feet, the Savior taught them that their happiness was contingent upon their service to others. President Thomas S. Monson similarly affirmed this truth. To find real happiness, we must seek for it in a focus outside ourselves. No one has learned the meaning of living until he has surrendered his ego to the service of his fellow man. Service to others is akin to duty, the fulfillment of which brings true joy. The Betrayal of Jesus Christ to Judas Iscariot Judas's betrayal of the Savior was a direct fulfillment of Psalm 41.9. It says, Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. The prophet Joseph Smith explained that those who were once in fellowship with the Lord and the saints can become enemies of the truth. Judas was rebuked and immediately betrayed his Lord into the hands of his enemies because Satan entered into him. There is a superior intelligence bestowed upon such as obey the gospel with full purpose of heart, which, if sinned against, the apostate is left naked and destitute of the Spirit of God, and he is, in truth, nigh unto cursing, and his end is to be burned. When once that light which was in them is taken from them, they become as much darkened as they were previously enlightened, and then no marvel if all their power should be enlisted against the truth, and they, Judas-like, seek the destruction of those who are their greatest benefactors. There was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples. In New Testament times, those dining at formal meals often reclined on low couches placed around tables. Leaning on their left arms with their heads toward the table and their feet pointed away from the table. Therefore, the guest seated to the right of the host would have leaned toward the host. This appears to have been where the Apostle John sat, leaning on Jesus' bosom or reclining toward Jesus during the meal. 
This position would have allowed John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, to have private conversations with the Savior that would not have been heard by everyone at the mill, such as the one concerning Jesus's, Judas's betrayal. What is a sop? The sop described in John 13.26 was a small piece of bread that those dining would use to scoop broth and meat from a bowl. Since it was a gesture of kindness and respect for the host to dip a sop and give it to a dinner guest, the Savior by this act presented Judas with an offer of friendship, perhaps one final opportunity for him to abandon his planned betrayal. The Savior gave a sop to Judas, after which Satan entered into him by saying to Judas that thou doest, do quickly. The Lord showed that he already knew what Judas had determined to do and that the time had come for him to act upon his final decision. The disciples of Jesus Christ are distinguished by love. After the Savior dismissed Judas, the setting was prepared for the Savior to give important teachings to the rest of the apostles, as recorded in John 13, 31 through 16.33. One of the first such teachings was the commandment to love others. This commandment is also found in Leviticus 19.18, which says, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. However, whereas in the Old Testament we are exhorted to love our neighbor as ourselves, here, the Savior commands us to love one another as he loves us. Elder Joseph B. Worthen of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles asked members of the church this question. What quality defines us best as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? As he answered this question, Elder Worthen shared the following thoughts about love as the distinguishing quality of disciples of Jesus Christ. Love is the beginning, the middle, and the end of the pathway of discipleship. It comforts, counsels, cures and consoles. It leads us through valleys of darkness and through the veil of death. In the end, love leads us to the glory and grandeur of eternal life. Brethren and sisters, as you prayerfully consider what you can do to increase harmony, spirituality, and build up the kingdom of God, consider your sacred duty to teach others to love the Lord and their fellow man. This is the central object of our existence. Without charity or the pure love of Christ, whatever else we accomplish matters little. With it, all else becomes vibrant and alive. When we inspire and teach others to fill their hearts with love, obedience flows from the inside out in voluntary acts of self-sacrifice and service. When Jesus gave his disciples a new commandment to love one another as I have loved you, he gave to them the grand key to happiness in this life and glory in the next. Love is the greatest of all the commandments. All others hang upon it. It is our focus as followers of the living Christ.